Greetings and welcome to another lecture in Introductory Psychology. This lecture, lecture is on an aspect of social psychology, what I like to call the rules of attraction. Now by attraction here I am talking about sexual attraction or uh, romantic attraction if you want to think about it that way. I actually do have another lecture here about the two possible types of love in terms of uh, for a spouse or a partner. This is a little bit more in terms of who just we find not only, well there's definitely a sexual attraction put in here as well. It's also a psychological slash romantic, but even romantic attractions involve sex for the most part. So why do you find someone hot? Why do, why do all of us, interestingly enough, have like this image of the perfect partner in our head? And let's go in some ways quite a bit with physical appearance, but also psychological. We think, oh, the person I'm going to wind up with is going to be like this and look like that, and I really like this and everything else, that sort of thing. And luckily, when we all have this search image in our head, it's not identical for every one of us. If we all only found the same people attractive, then the vast majority of us would be out of luck. So it's interesting sometimes to sit back and think about all the people that you have found attractive over the years, possibly decades in some cases, and find out what they all had in common. Because the odds are you have a type. And so the question here is, you know, why do we have types? Why is it that we tend to be attracted to the same people, to the same behavior patterns, to the same appearances? And what researchers have found is that we tend to be attracted to people who are similar to us people who think like us and act like us and look like us and behave like us. And we're talking not just psychological but also physical. Researchers looking at similarities between married couples have found that married couples tend to resemble each other physically to a very large degree. And these aren't just this whole, well, when you live together long enough, you grow to look alike. We're talking underlying things. You can't grow to look like someone unless you already kind of look like them to begin with. And it does appear that we're looking for someone who is similar to us. People who are married tend to marry someone similar to you. It tends to be much more of a birds of a feather flock together than an opposites attract sort of thing. Although we can all probably think of an opposites attract, it's a whole lot easier to think of people who wind up together who are really quite similar. And of course the question then is why do we go for similarity? And one of the reasons is proximity. Proximity is that even today in the era of of intercontinental travel and the internet, we still tend to fall in love with and eventually marry or settle down with someone who lives near us. Maybe not as much as we used to in the past when there were people who spent their whole lives without ever leaving their hometown. But still, I mean, we, we tend to hook up with people, particularly long-term hookups, that, that live near us, that grew up near us, that uh, live near us when we find them, of course, and do realize that human beings have a tendency to live near people who are like them. Remember the whole in-group, out-group thing. We tend to be most comfortable around other people that are similar to us, both in looks as well as in behavior, likes and dislikes, and so therefore it would kind of make sense, since we're close to people who are similar to us, that the people we're close to are the people we're going to be attracted to. There's also something called the mere exposure effect. And the mere exposure effect says that assuming you don't hate something, the more you're exposed to something, the more you're going to like it. Now, as I said, this isn't true if you hate something. If you hate something to begin with, the more you're exposed to it, the more you're going to hate it. But let's say that you're kind of neutral, you don't care either way, or you kind of mildly like something. The more you're exposed to it, the more you're going to like it. Parents, for instance, are told that when they are introducing new food to their children, they shouldn't just introduce it once, and if the kid doesn't like it, never serve it again. You're supposed to introduce it like a half a dozen times or ten times because it's quite possible that at the end of six meals over a period of time of course of that new food the child finds that they like it. It might be the reason that radio stations play the same ten songs over and over again or at least that's what it sounds like is because the more times you hear that song assuming you don't hate it to begin with the more you're going to like it. 
And who are we exposed to all the time? People who live near us. Have you ever heard somebody say, well, at first I didn't think this person was that attractive, but over time they kind of grew on me, and now I think they're gorgeous. We're talking the mere exposure effect. Or, I didn't like them at first, but the more I got to know them, the more I got to like them. Mere exposure effect. Another reason why we go with similarity is that marriage is a negotiation. You're basically having two, or in some cases more, people who have decided to merge their lives onto one pathway to live together, to raise children together perhaps, and essentially, hopefully, in, in most cases, people want to spend the rest of their lives together. And it's a whole lot easier to do that if you're similar than if you're different. There's a lot less arguing. I think we should live here. So do I. I like this politician. So do I. I think that this sporting team sucks. So do I. You know, that just makes life a whole lot easier, doesn't it? as opposed to all the fighting and no I don't and yes you do and you know it's just a lot easier for people to stick together when they are similar. I find the reciprocity of liking very amusing because it reminds me of the better parts of fourth grade. Because fourth grade generally in a lot of cases was when kids started having crushes on one another. Little fairly platonic ones at that age but still crushes. But you wouldn't go up to your crush E and basically say, you know, I have a crush on you or I like you or something, you know, equally committing. Instead, what you would do, perhaps, is you would ask your friend who would then go talk to that person's friend and sort of see if they liked you, because if they liked you, then it was okay for you to like them. You know, politics at a young age. The reciprocity of liking says that we tend to like people who like us. That's it. We like people who like us. When you find out someone likes you, you're going to be more likely to like them and maybe like them more. And of course, who do we tend to like? We tend to like people similar to us. We like our in-group, in-group favoritism. We tend to like people who like the same things that we do. Right? They obviously have good taste. So the reciprocity of liking also seems to indicate that we like people who are similar to us, right? Because that's just how things work. Now, when you're talking physical similarities, of course, that's also important. We tend to go for people who are similar to us, but not people who are too similar to us. Because, of course, the people who are most similar to us are relatives. And generally, they, as we might say, are off the menu. Incest is having sexual relations with someone who is too closely related to you. And I put that little pause in after incest showed up because people have a tendency to go, Ugh, when they hear that word. It's amusing in my face-to-face -face classes because I'll put that up, but the whole class will kind of go, Ugh. even if they don't physically say that, I see this little shudder go through the class. Okay, it's just gross. Well, Everybody tends to react like that. Ew, incest, ew, ew. The interesting thing about incest, though, and the incest taboo, is that it's not biological. At least it's not purely biological. Okay? This is not something that we just automatically know, that people who are related to us are just ew. It's something that apparently is learned. And this appears to be true. Well, first of all, it could be true because there have been cases of brothers and sisters raised separately who never knew one another and who therefore over the course of time or whatever met and fell in love with one another and if it was truly biology preventing that if it was something like smell which appears to work on a lot of other mammals that if they smell bad or smell wrong then you know they're off the menu um, that doesn't appear to work with us also, different cultures have different views of what incest actually is and how close you can go before it gets gross. In most of the United States, for instance, you can go to second cousins. Second cousins share great -grand one set of great-grandparents. And since they have, I believe, eight sets of great-grandparents, one could argue that that is not really that close. Or in those cases, they would have seven <laughs> sets of grandparents, great-grandparents, uh, something like that. Um, now, but there are some states where it's, o it's legal for first cousins to marry. First cousins, of course, share grandparents because their parents would be brothers and sisters. Legal and 
people don't necessarily even in those places go ooh. Now, there are also other cultures where this sort of thing gets to a bit of an extreme. Uh, royalty around the world generally only marries other royalty. They don't want to dilute the blood. This is where Prince William of Great Britain has really broken with tradition because the woman he married, Catherine, uh, is not related to him in any way. And that's the first time that that has happened in the British royal family in far too long, some would argue. You know, even, even his mother and his father. Princess Diana and Prince Charles were just were at least somewhat distantly related. Uh, there's a lot of cousin marriage because that's what you do. You have to keep the royal blood in the family. The people who took this to the extremes, as far as we can tell, and we, there were at least two cultures that took this to an extreme. That would be ancient Egypt and the ancient Hawaiians. In both cases, they were so concerned about royal blood leaving the family that brothers would marry sisters. And uncles would marry nieces and aunts would marry nephews and I mean yes it was and over time that tends to develop into problems because you know it's not necessarily going to be a problem instantly the thing is though that if an individual carries for instance a nasty recessive gene for something with a recessive gene you have to get two copies one from mom and one from dad to actually get the disorder well if an individual carries a particular nasty recessive who else is quite likely to carry that same nasty recessive a relative and over time you have problems with immune system dysfunctions it's not a good idea really this sort of what in an animal breeding they call line breeding there's also but but for them, they considered that that was what you did. You married your brother or your sister. I read about a culture once in the South Pacific where everybody on your mother's side of the family was off limits, but everyone on your dad's side was fair game. Possibly because biologically, you pretty much always know for sure who your mom is, but without a DNA test, who dad is might be a little dicier. But at any rate, it does appear that the incest taboo is learned. And there's been some research looking into exactly when is it learned, looking at adopted children, for instance. You would think that adopted kids, they're not biologically related at all. You know, why aren't they getting it on once they hit puberty at every opportunity? When for the most part, the response you get from them is, ew, even though biologically it wouldn't be a problem. The Westermark effect says that the incest taboo is learned between birth and the age of six. Between birth and six years old, generally, anyone you live close to in the same household or, or you have close to, you, you have close contact with, between birth and the age of six is ineligible. Which makes sense because normally who do you live close to between birth and the age of six? Your brothers and sisters and father and mother and, and cousins and what all else. Particularly in times when people used to live, you know, in, in big houses and large family. You know, multiple generations in one house. Um, this is also true, as I said, for adopted kids. Kids adopted at birth want nothing whatsoever to do with their adopted siblings because, ew. But on the other hand, with blended families, if the children are blended over the age of six, there's a possibility that they may not pick up on this. The older they are, of course, the less likely they are to have picked up on this. And that's when you have to rely more or less on uh, less on the visceral ew reaction and more of the, well, that's my sister now and so no touchy. Um, but the Westermark effect says that everyone between birth and the age of six that we're close to is off the menu. And for the most part, as I said, that works pretty well. We like people who are similar, but not too similar.